Welcome to a special edition of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This episode explores the trajectory and the history of the old ACLU, the ACLU that formed and became the leading civil liberties organization in the latter half of the 20th century. And in order to explore that, my guest today is Ira Glasser, who was the executive director of the ACLU for 23 years, from 1978 until 2001. He resigned shortly before the 9-11 attacks. He retired. Uh, and in that time, he built the ACLU from a financially precarious organization into a genuine powerhouse that endures until today. And he's also the star of a very newly released documentary that I cannot recommend highly enough called Mighty Ira, which is a reference to not heaping undue superlative praise on him, but to a baseball poem because of the base, the role that baseball played in his upbringing, which examines not just the history of his work with the ACLU, but also the history of the United States in the latter half of the 20th century that shaped who he was and that gives the context to why civil liberties became such a supremely important cause for so many ACLU leaders and others on the left like him defending the free speech rights and the due process rights, not of the most powerful and the most popular, but of the most marginalized and the most despised. And one of the things I found so fascinating about this film genuinely is it is so rich in history. So often our debates about things like free speech, which are ongoing, very much vibrant in, in our current contemporary political discourse, is it takes place in a kind of historical void. We, we look maybe two years back or five years back, when if we look back to the real history, decades instead of years, the debate would be so much more richly informed. And there are a few people who can help us understand the evolution of that debate, the evolution of the ACLU, better than Ira Glasser. Now, he became, as I said, the ACLU executive director in 1978, which was one year after the ACLU accepted the extremely controversial case of representing a neo-Nazi group that wanted to march through the town of Skokie, Illinois. At the time that they took it, he wasn't the executive director of the ACLU. He was with the New York Civil Liberties Union, but became one of the biggest defenders of the ACLU's position in that case and continued to do so as he dealt with the fallout as the executive director. And the Skokie event was probably one of the most important civil liberties episodes in the latter half of the 20th century to help us understand what free speech is and why it's so important. And few played as critical of a role in defending the ACLU's position and therefore teaching an entire generation about the values of free speech, particularly on the left, uh, as Ira Glasser did. Just as a quick summary the case involved a group of actual Nazis, people who dressed up with swastika armbands and the historic uniforms of the Nazi uh, party in World War II era Germany. And they wanted, they applied for a permit to have a march through Skokie, Illinois. And Skokie, Illinois was a town filled overwhelmingly not just with Jewish residents, but with actual Holocaust survivors, thousands and thousands of people who were in the camps in Eastern and Western Europe during the war, who survived the Holocaust, and they had tattoos on their arm, and that was the defining trauma of their life. So you can imagine how horrifying and traumatic it would be to have to watch through their town marching people with those uniforms of the people who slaughtered many of their, or most of their family, who tortured them, who put them through such hell, and yet the ACLU, led primarily by Jewish lawyers and Jewish activists, defended the right of the Nazis to march through Skokie. They sued the town of Skokie, Illinois, when Skokie's city officials denied the Nazis a permit to do so. And at the time, it was an incredibly controversial stance, not just in the United States, but also within the civil liberties community. Many Jewish donors, many Jewish lawyers, many staff members up in the ACLU rebelled, were disgusted, stopped donating, left the organization. It threatened the survival, the viability of the ACLU. And yet leaders like Ira Glasser persisted unflinchingly in arguing that not only was it justifiable, but necessary for the ACLU to take that free speech 
position, and it's a position that to this very day he holds. And two of the things I found so fascinating about our discussion about the Skokie case was number one, there's obviously an erosion on the left in American liberalism in terms of a belief in free speech, particularly when it comes to the threat of Nazism or fascism or white supremacy. We saw that erosion very strongly with a lot of revulsion toward the ACLU in 2017 when they defended white supremacists and their right to march and hold a protest at a prominent place in Charlottesville, Virginia. And Ira gives an incredibly compelling, very eloquent, very thoughtful defense of why it is crucial for the left, not just on moral and ethical grounds, but in their self-interest to continue to affirm this maximalist view of free speech that the government should never be able to restrict or constrain the viewpoints that people are permitted to express, that allowing the states to do that is infinitely more dangerous than whatever danger you think you're combating. And in fact, nothing helps that danger more than censoring it and turning it into martyrs. And he makes, because he's thought about it for decades and lived through so many of those cases, the Skokie case is by no means the only time the ACLU represented white supremacists, the KKK, neo-Nazis and the like. They did so many, many times. That was just the most prominent. So in terms of making that case, even if you're somebody who doesn't believe in it, I think listening to somebody like this, who has been one of the leaders in formulating this view of free speech, is something that will be very beneficial no matter whether you believe in it or especially if you don't. The other thing I found so fascinating about his defense of this version of free speech is that he speaks as somebody who himself identified as being marginalized. He grew up as a Jew in Brooklyn in the mid 20th century when Jews were systemically discriminated against, very different than the way American Jews are treated Today, they were banned from most country clubs of a certain time. They were barred from joining many white shoe law firms. They were had all kinds of uh, societal sectors placed off limits to them. And his, his, his identity as a child was very much shaped by the idea that he was a member of a marginalized group. And then his formative political cause became racial justice. He had almost a religious-like veneration for the Brooklyn Dodgers who played at the now destroyed Ebbets Field because as the film discusses, that was where Jackie Robinson became the first African-American player to play in Major League Baseball at Ebbets Field, which shaped his life mission, which became racial justice. He ended up working for Robert Kennedy, even though he was very much to the left of Robert Kennedy politically because he believed that RFK was one of the few white politicians with a genuine passionate commitment to the cause of racial justice. And he talks about how it is above everybody else, those people who are marginalized, most marginalized, who have the greatest interest in defending the people whose views we find reprehensible and their rights of free speech, precisely because the precedents that otherwise will take root that allow censorship will be directed at the most marginalized. And he notes how so many civil rights leaders African-American civil rights leaders of the 60s and 70s often were the most vocal, the leaders, in defending what the ACLU did in Skokie, with defending what the ACLU did in defending the free speech rights of everybody, including people with despicable far-right views, because they knew that censorship precedent would be used against them as well. And I think that this history is not just fascinating in its own right, but really illuminates so much of what we need to understand about our current debates as the left and liberals and everyone across the spectrum struggles with their own views and their own support of free speech rights, of due process rights for even the people that we find most dangerous and most reprehensible. The other aspect of the film that I found really fascinating was that Ira Glasser formed two extremely close friendships with two extremely unlikely people. One was the leader of the Holocaust survivors in Skokie who were indignant about what the ACLU was doing in defending the neo-Nazis' right to march through their town. In particular, one of them, Ben Stein, who was a 95-year-old Polish survivor of several camps, including Buchenwald and Auschwitz, uh, was the leader of the Holocaust survivors threatening violence against the Nazis if they did end up 
marching through Skokie. They ended up not marching through Skokie. They actually got a permit to march through Chicago instead, which is what they wanted, and were wildly outnumbered when they did. But Ben Stein became a very close friend of Ira Glasser, even though to the day that Ben Stein died, he vehemently disagreed with what Ira Glasser and the ACLU did in that case, but their friendship transcended that disagreement. The other very close friendship that Ira ended up forming was with William Buckley, the longtime right-wing founder of National Review, a segregationist until he reformed his segregationist views. They started off having vicious uh, arguments on Buckley's show on Firing Line, but then formed a friendship. And I asked Ira about those two friendships and why it is that he found it important for himself and why he believes it's important for society generally to try and open dialogue with those people with whom we disagree most. And I found his, I found his answers extremely moving, extremely thoughtful, and also extremely relevant to how we think about our current place in society today. So um, I think that uh, Ira is somebody who has lived through a great deal. Um, he has been very vocal in his criticisms of the current iteration of the ACLU. Uh, he was very uh, vehemently critical of how he perceived the ACLU to back away from some of its free speech, long-standing free speech positions in the wake of the anger over Charlottesville, and we talk about that. He has said in other interviews that he believes that the influx of huge amounts of liberal money, millions and millions of dollars of it in the name of stopping Trump, threatens to turn the ACLU not into from a civil liberties organization, what it's always been, into just another standard liberal political group. And we don't spend a lot of time on his criticism of the ACLU because that wasn't what the film covered, but he has been very open about it before. But we do talk about Charlottesville. We talk about the reason why it's so critical that the ACLU not be turned into just another standard liberal activist group, but retain its unique position as a group that defends the civil liberties of all people across the political spectrum, not just liberals, but even those people who liberals hate the most. He's probably one of the most effective advocates of the view that civil liberties defenses um, of everybody are not just ethically and morally necessary, but strategically necessary as well, particularly if you're a member of a marginalized group or hold views that are on the fringes of, or, of, of society or yourself are a dissident. So I really enjoyed this discussion. I've been a long time admirer of that version of the ACLU. There are still a lot of lawyers who believe in that version of the ACLU at the ACLU, but there are a lot of them who, who don't. And so I think understanding how the ACLU became the ACLU at the end of the last century is really important to understanding the debate surrounding civil liberties in the ACLU now. Um, and also, again, I cannot recommend the film highly enough. It's online. Um, because of the COVID pandemic, it had a virtual debut. It's showing at a movie theater, but online. Um, and, you know, it's as, as a civil libertarian, both as a lawyer and a journalist, I was bound to like this film no matter what. But it wildly exceeded my expectations in large part because so much of the history that it showed was history I didn't know, was really eye-opening, and most important of all, lent so much uh, knowledge and shed so much light on the debates that we're currently entertaining and conducting now as a society that I found it not just entertaining and interesting, but highly educative as well. So here's my conversation with Ira, which I really hope you enjoy as much as I do. My top priority when I first got to the National ACLU, I thought was going to be racial justice. Mr. Ira Glasser head of the American Civil Liberties Union. What years? 78 to 2001. Throughout its existence, the American Civil Liberties Union has defended unpopular causes. Actually, my top priority turned out to be organizational survival. American Nazi party leader Frank Collin has been trying to hold a march through the streets of Skokie, Illinois. The ACLU is opposed to defend the free speech of Nazis. The reaction of the Holocaust survivors was very understandable. It brought up all our pains, all our losses of the families. We can do it. This is only the beginning. You would defend it again today if you had to? Yes. The First Amendment is what permits people to organize for social justice goals. 
Surely Charlottesville is a lot like Scopey. White supremacists were looking for a way to flex their muscles. It highlighted the issue of why would you ever want to defend the rights of people like that? We cannot forget history. We cannot forget what our leaders, our mentors, and champions did for society. The tide of liberty and individual rights, equal justice, is clearly with us, but only if we keep swimming. So I am delighted to be joined now by Ira Glasser, who was the executive director of the ACLU from 1978 until 2001. He retired just a few months before the 9-11 attack, and he is the, I guess we can call him the star of an outstanding new documentary released just last week called Mighty Ira that looks not only at his life and, has, and at his work as the executive director at the ACLU during this incredibly fascinating time period, but also weaves in the history of the United States going back to the 40s, 50s, and 60s into his personal formation in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to understand how the ACLU of that era became the leading civil liberty organization in the United States. Ira, first of all, congratulations on this incredible film, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the congratulations is due to uh, Nico Perino and his crew who uh, who started this out uh, uh, in a way that seemed a whole lot less ambitious than it turned out to be. And they, you know, for the young people who made, who had never made a film before, I thought it, it, it was fantastic. They did a great, great job with a lot of, you know, complex material that they weaved in and it was... Uh, it was wonderful. I'm getting a particular kick out of uh, having my, my grandchildren watch it, who are now, you know, 18, 19, 20, 24, and um, all of whom were born after my time at the ACLU. And uh, so it's, you know, it's been, it's been fun and it's, um, it, was, it was nice to watch. Although I must say the, the, uh, the title, Mighty Ira, which I didn't know about and didn't see until I watched the film myself for the first time. Um, was a, was a a little a little embarrassing uh, <laughs> in some ways, but, but it's a throwaway. It, it's, it, it's a reference to to baseball. To Mighty Casey, Central, Mighty to Casey at the bat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So that summary of the film and your reaction to it is really the perfect segue into what I wanted to begin by asking you about as a lawyer who defended civil liberties. Uh, in multiple cases, and then I was a journalist who has been an ardent supporter of the ACLU's defense of civil liberties. I was probably someone who was going to like this film no matter what it did, but it really did significantly exceed my expectations in large part because the way it weaved in the history of civil liberties and of political debates of the 50s, 60s, and 70s isn't just a fascinating history unto itself, but really sheds a great deal of illuminating light on so many of our contemporary debates around free speech and due process and civil liberties and how we weigh those against other competing societal threats. And I want to begin by asking you about one of the events that was a principal topic of the film, which was the extremely controversial decision of the ACLU in 1977 to defend the free speech rights of neo-Nazis to march through the town of Skokie, Illinois, a town filled not just with a large number of Jewish residents, but actual Holocaust survivors. There were thousands upon thousands of actual Holocaust survivors, people who survived the camps of Nazi Germany during, the World War, during World War II, who obviously were going to be very disturbed, very traumatized by seeing Nazis wearing swastika armbands and uniforms marching through their town. And yet the ACLU, while you are at the New York chapter, or, uh, but a, certainly a, an important part of the ACLU, uh, defended their right, sued on their behalf uh, against the town's denial of a permit for them to march there. And you were an ardent defender of that. Um, you, to this day, are an ardent defender of that decision, even though 
it really did threaten the very existence of the ACLU. You had a lot of Jewish lawyers and Jewish donors and other donors who were so offended that they stopped donating at a time when the organization was already financial in financial peril. You had tons of internal strife, and yet you were an unflinching defender, as were the other leaders of the ACLU, about not just the uh, justifiability, but the necessity of the ACLU to defend the right of those Nazis to exercise their First Amendment rights. Why was that such an important case in your view? Why was it worth jeopardizing the very existence of the ACLU, offending so many supporters and donors and even people on staff in order to take that case? What were those principles at stake? The fact is, is that the acrimony took us by surprise because we had defended free speech uh, for, for people like that and for the Klan and for all kinds of hateful people, um, hateful to us, uh, since, since the ACLU was started. Uh, you know, Roger Baldwin, who, who, who began the ACLU and was still uh, very much alive when I came into the ACLU and whom I, I knew quite well and talked to about this a lot of times, always love to tell the story about how they started out the ACLU to defend the free speech rights of themselves, uh, of anti-war protesters, of the labor union organizers, of, uh, of uh, Margaret Sanger distributing leaflets on the street, providing information on birth control. Uh, these were all his issues. He was a political activist and they, their free speech continued to be repressed. Uh, the First Amendment didn't work for them. Uh, this is in sort of 1916, 17, around there. And so when they started the ACLU in 1920, uh, it was really to protect free speech for political activists on the left, as they saw it. Uh, that's who they were. And then he describes, Baldwin describes that one day the, the guy walks into the office and introduces himself as the Grand Dragon of the, of the Klan and says uh, the cops are not letting them demonstrate. And, and he says, that was the moment we first had to decide, are we serious about this? I mean, do we, do we have to defend these vermin um, as, as he thought they were? Uh, and they realized that if they wanted to protect their own rights to speech, they had to protect these guys' rights too, because the only alternative was to give the government the discretion to decide whose speech to permit and whose speech to prohibit. And they realized as social justice as activists themselves that they would never be the ones to make that decision. And that most often, if you gave the government the discretion to decide whose speech to permit and whose speech to prohibit, they would end up on the short end of the stick. So it was like an insurance policy. Uh, if they wanted the right to free speech, they had to deny the government the power to decide. And the only way to do that was to defend the rights of people, no matter what they said, and no matter who they were, whenever the government made uh, exercised the power that the government should never have, and that that's what the First Amendment meant. And so, you know, that, that was a line that they crossed uh, early on in the ACLU, and it never varied. So. So in any year, in my experience, I came to the ACLU in 1967 um, uh, in the New York branch, uh, and, and uh, there wasn't a year where we didn't have a half dozen, a dozen of these cases around the country. Um, uh, you know, there were people who didn't like it, uh, but it was never internally controversial, and we never had masses of members resigning over it. it these were this is what the ACLU did everybody sort of understood it so so for us the the reaction of having large numbers of people quitting um, uh, and costing us enormous amounts of money uh, really threatening the existence of the ACLU for a while uh, took us all by surprise because the the Skokie case was never controversial inside the organization there was no particular debate about it. It was routine for us. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it wasn't like we made a courageous decision <laughs> knowing what the consequences were. 
Uh, it was that we made a normal decision um, that was a, uh, you know, a, a consistent part of the ACLU's uh, history and tradition, and were completely blindsided and surprised by, by the reaction. Of course, we understood afterwards why, uh, because the town of Skokie happened to be home to thousands of Holocaust survivors, and they were not about to countenance uh, the, the guys with swastikas walking through their streets again. And and um, uh, but but the 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 external controversy, uh, the size of it, the ferocity of it, um, surprised us. But there was never any debate inside the organization about whether we should withdraw or change our position or anything like that. It was really a question of, I mean, we knew we were going to win the case. It was an unlosable case. Um, and the question was whether all that publicity um, uh, that was generating lots of people quitting the ACLU uh, was going to um, be a kind of a knockout punch for an organization that was already uh, in, in, in sort of tenuous shape financially as as organizations often are so so that's um uh it, it it didn't take as much courage as it as it seemed and in fact i later discovered glenn that <laughs> that many of the people who wrote in to say they were quitting the aclu weren't members right, and right. <laughs> I, I remember i remember writing back to to one or more of them saying um it's very difficult for us to be hurt uh, by people quitting who weren't with us to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like people who write to the New York Times say, I'm canceling my subscription. I think 80% yes. of the time they don't actually have they a subscription. Have one, right. Yeah. Um, well, and, and just so, I mean, I know the answer to this, but I think it'd be worth hearing it from you just for people who aren't as familiar with the history. I'm looking back on that controversy and kind of the trajectory of U.S. politics since then, 40 years later, um, with a lot of talk about white supremacist groups and neo-fascist groups and the like. Is that a decision that you regret? Is it something that you still to this day believe was the right decision? And if you were the head of the ACLU in 2020 and were faced with a similar choice, would you make the same decision? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's important for people to understand there's a strategy here. This is not, you know, some ivory tower, uh, uh, philosophical, uh, pure, unrelated to reality decision that we make in our own heads. There is a real political strategy uh, in, in a decision like this. The political strategy is that it's too dangerous, especially if you're a vulnerable minority. It's too dangerous to allow the government the discretion to decide who should be allowed to speak. I mean, think of who the people would be who would be making those decisions. In my teenage years, it would have been Joe McCarthy. It would have been Richard Nixon. Um, uh, do people today want Donald Trump and William Barr to be deciding who should speak? Who Who do you think is gonna be hurt by or, that? Or their judges, right? Or the judges appointed by That's Donald right. Trump or George W. Bush. Exactly. I mean, you know, when the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law prohibiting speech, abridging speech, or freedom of assembly. It, it means that even if the entire democracy, 100% unanimously in Congress, all 535 of them, decide that you shouldn't speak, they don't have the power to do that. And that, that doesn't protect the establishment. It protects vulnerable minorities. You know, in the 1990s, uh, when the hate speech codes first began to be popular on college campuses, I used to go, I was still at the ACLU then, I used to go to speak to groups of black students who were then, you know, being finally admitted to these universities, but were, were in the minority, were embattled, um, and, and they were in favor of these hate speech codes. They wanted to ban David Duke and people like that. And I used to go speak to them. And they, of course, knew when I came that I was an advocate of the First Amendment. But they also knew 
that I was a fierce advocate of racial justice because that's what we did at the ACLU. And that was probably the major issue for me. And, and so they, they were puzzled by this. And I did not give them a lecture on the First Amendment. I told them they were being politically stupid. I told them that, you know, if, if the kind of hate speech codes that they wanted on their college campus had been enforced in the 1960s, their most frequent victim would have been Malcolm X or Eldridge Cleaver. Yeah, or the right. Weather Underground or the Black <clears throat> Panthers or... Right, exactly. And, you know, when people talk about, you know, the, the white nationalists bringing guns to demonstrations, well, you know, if they're going to bring, if they're going to use guns, if they're going to bring loaded guns, if they're going to, I mean, violence is not protected by the First Amendment. But, um, you know, when the Black Panthers marched around with guns in the 60s, the ACLU didn't walk away from those, those cases. The ACLU didn't say they didn't have a right because you can't walk around with guns. So if, if, if you want to allow the Black Panthers to walk around with guns, then you have to allow the white nationalists to walk around with guns. What you don't have to allow, what you must not allow, is for them to use violence at demonstrations to interfere with other people's rights to say different things. And, and that's, that's the issue. I mean, what happened in Charlottesville was a police well, let me, let me, uh, I want to, I want to work my, I want to work my way up to Charlottesville. Um, because I, I definitely want to, I have I don't know your views very well on that. And I, I want to delve into that in like a, a, an important, in a systematic way, because it is so important. Um, the kind of trajectory of the ACLU. But before before we get there, I just have a couple of questions um, that I want to ask you. Um, you know, it, it's, it is so interesting because uh, I never understand why people trust, who don't trust the government, you know, who don't trust the Trump administration, who don't trust the FBI, who don't trust the Justice Department, who don't trust the Congress or the Supreme Court, who believe that if you just let them censor, they're going to censor in ways that will be benevolent or protect the marginalized. You know, I, I represented a neo-Nazi once um, over the question of whether Nazis who have racist views can be barred from working as lawyers because they lack the character and fitness. And the precedent that I use to defend that uh, client were all the cases from the 1950s and 1960s where the bar associations tried to ban communists on the grounds that they lack the character right. and fitness because that's who was going to typically be... Right targeted and, and but the, the argument that I that I encounter a lot even now from people who are critics of the, your your view of the the first amendment or this kind of work is um well look it's not that we think that they these kind of people should be censored but why is it that you or the ACLU with all the people who are in need of legal assistance have to do the work and I have friends who worked at the ACLU are very traditionalist believers in free speech and one of the points they make often is look the reason the ACLU has been effective is because judges know that we're not just any other liberal advocacy group, that the fact that they know that we represent people we don't agree with is what makes us effective in court. And if the perception becomes that we're just another liberal advocacy group, we're going to be much less effective in court because people will know that we're not really defending principles. We're just defending ideology or partisanship. Is that concept for you not just another liberal advocacy group different than say like the people for the American way or move on or any of the other liberal advocacy groups yes, absolutely. kind of yes. central to the ACLU's absolutely. function. Yes. I, be I believe it is central in part because I believe it is unique. Um, you know, the, I'm, I regard myself, uh, the word I have always used is liberal because that's the word I grew up with. I suppose if I was 19 years old today, I would use the word progressive. But um, the fact is, is that is that I regard myself as 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 a liberal uh, politically. Always have. Um, uh, I used to joke that um, uh, ninety percent of the people whose whose speech I defend, I, I I would just assume that never hear another word from them. <laughs> you know. But but uh, but the fact is, is that there are a lot of liberal progressive political groups. Uh, people for the American way is one of them, but there's there's lots of them. And 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 as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier. I those those are my views. Um, but there's only one ACLU, and and if the ACLU uh, wasn't there, there would be nobody who would be defending that principle that I described a moment ago of you got to keep the government from having the power to decide. 
who to speak, who is allowed to speak. Um, because if you want to protect the rights of minorities, um, you have to understand that every social justice movement in America, whether you're talking about the labor union movement, the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement, uh, uh, the prisoners' rights movement, every single one began with free speech because they began from a position of weakness and they needed to gather support. I mean, look at how the Black, uh, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is working today. What is it doing? It's out in the streets. It's, it's having demonstrations. Where would they be if Trump were allowed to do what he tried to do in Portland, Oregon? Um, they would be nowhere. John Lewis once said that uh, uh, the, the, uh, without the right uh, to, to speak and the right to dissent, um, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. And that's true of every social justice movement that's ever existed. So the idea that somehow social justice and free speech are antagonists, when in fact they are critical allies, uh, is just historically and politically wrong. Um, this is not a matter of, you know, ivory tower law school philosophical debates. This is a matter of, of a political strategy. And, and yes, if the ACLU was not well known for defending free speech, no matter whose speech it was, we would have lost most of our credibility in the courts and in the legislature. When the, the, there was a constitutional amendment to, to amend the First Amendment to permit uh, the criminality of flag burning uh, in the in the uh, in the 1990s, I think it was, uh, maybe the late 80s. Uh, the only reason we had any credibility with Republicans whose votes we needed to stop that amendment, um, and this would have been the first time in the history of the country that the First Amendment was was amended to permit the government to ban speech. The only way we had the credibility is that they took our argument seriously because they knew that we were not just advocating the First Amendment for people we agreed with. We were advocating the First Amendment uh, for anybody. And, and, and that argument had credibility only because of the consistency with which we uh, defended it uh, in, 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 in choosing our clients. And, you know, the other thing I should say is that it's not as if we ever sat in a room and decided, let's defend the Nazis or let's defend the Klan. We never pick our clients. The government picks our clients by deciding who it is that they're going to suppress. You know, even in the Skokie case, uh, most people don't know this, but, but we didn't start the case. The town of Skokie started the case. The town of Skokie went into court to get a court order um, on the basis of an unconstitutional ordinance that they had passed to stop the Nazis. And we were already resisting the same kind of a case on behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. Association in Chicago nearby. And we only got into that case because the town of Skokie started it. And, and, who, and nobody else was gonna represent the, clan, the, uh, the neo-Nazis. I mean, people say, well, why do you have to do it? Uh, well, who else was going to do it? Um, some some white shoe law firm? No. Uh, some liberal progressive organization? No. Um, so the fact is, if we didn't respond to what the town of Skokie did by going into court, by defending the neo-Nazis, we it would have compromised our ability to defend the Martin Luther King Jr. Association in Chicago on the identical legal issue. Okay, so uh, before we get into to Charlottesville um, and the kind of current debates around the role the ACLU is playing today and, and some of the political work that they've now for the first time in their history started doing, kind of election related work, um, I just wanna ask you about this issue of racial justice because it was so central to the film. Um, I, did, I didn't know um, that your background was not as a lawyer or litigator, but as an activist, um, which I think made a big difference. And, and what I also didn't know was how critical the civil rights movement was and, and the cause of racial justice was to your whole childhood. I mean, the start of the film is you revisiting the now destroyed Abbott's Field, 
where the Brooklyn Dodgers played and they were kind of almost had this religious importance to you in large part because it was the place where Jackie Robinson played as the first African-American in Major League Baseball. Um, and you have this kind of draw to Robert F. Kennedy, even though I think the film suggested you were to the left of him politically, but believed he was the only politician or one of the few white politicians really devoted to the cause of the civil rights movement and, and racial justice. So racial justice hovers over the film, over the history, obviously, that it covered, and also your work in the ACLU. You talked about how the two are complementary for reasons that you laid out very well, but are there instances in which kind of free speech or civil liberties values on the one hand and racial justice on the other can come into conflict? And when they do, how do you resolve that? This is a complicated, the question is not complicated, but the answer is complicated. And it's complicated by the fact that, you know, when at the ACLU, we defended lots of rights, uh, you know, the whole, a whole range of rights uh, codified in the Bill of Rights and some that weren't in the Bill of Rights or weren't yet in the Bill of Rights. Um, and a lot of these issues had conflicts at the margins. For example, if you're defending freedom of the press and you're also defending the right to privacy, what do you do when some reporter gets a hold of some piece of information about an individual that shouldn't be disclosed and decides to publish it? Um, on the one hand, you want to defend the right of privacy of the person uh, whose privacy is being compromised. On the other hand, you want to defend the freedom of the press uh, and, and, and it creates a conflict. I use it as an example because I never remember any civil liberties question on any issue that at the margins didn't compromise another civil liberties question. And so there were, there were times where you just had to figure out, well, how do we navigate this? Uh, how do we do it? And that occupied a lot of our internal discussions all the time. Now, you know, in, in terms of racial justice and the First Amendment, um, it didn't happen very often, uh, but, but you know, there was a time uh, not, not, not too distant from the, from the time of the Skokie case where the Klan in the South had basically been defanged. And they, they, were, they, were, they were relatively, uh, you know, once Jim Crow was gone and the Civil Rights Act was passed, they were relatively on the other side of you know, they didn't like the idea that blacks could vote. They didn't like the idea of integrated schools. They didn't like the idea that blacks could go into a restaurant and be served. Um, but now, instead of, uh, you know, putting on their hoods and going out at night and, and, and burning people and hanging people, um, they were reduced to marching in the streets of Atlanta, uh, demonstrating against what they didn't like. So the issue came up. Um, the city of Atlanta tried to stop them and this, they did the same thing that the Nazis did in Skokie. They came to us for help because who the hell else was going to help them? <laughs> and of course, we hated everything they stood for. We fought against everything they stood for. We prevailed, which is why they were now demonstrating <laughs> against what we had prevailed on. And so we represented them. And uh, there came and that got to be very controversial. And in Mississippi, um, uh, we had successfully recruited uh, black people for the first time to be on the board of directors of the ACLU of Mississippi, and a lot of them quit in the same way that happened with Jews in Skokie. And it was unfortunate, uh, but you know, you you couldn't tell black people whose relatives and friends had been lynched, that they had to stand by and watch these people in their pillowcases and their sheets parading through town in the same way that you couldn't tell Holocaust survivors that they simply had to tolerate guys with swastikas walking through their streets, even if they were doing it peacefully. But you also could not allow the law to use that sympathy to gain the power to decide who to speak, uh, who, should, who should be able to speak. 
So I end up on the Donahue show, which was a big, probably at the time. Yeah, I was about to mention that. That was an amazing scene. Go ahead and describe that. I I really love that. It was, it was, uh, uh, I used to be on that show often in those years. And it was the most widely watched, uh, you know, political public issue talk show in the country at the time. And they did it out of Chicago, but it was, it was nationally uh, televised. And, and Phil Donahue calls me up and, and asked me if I would come on and defend uh, our decision to, to represent the Klan in that case. And I say, yes. And I come on and who is there uh, as one of the people to, 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 to debate, but Hosea Williams. Uh, I didn't know him personally at the time, but Hosea was a top lieutenant of Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And, and, uh, uh, and I think Phil fully expected that he, Hosea and I were gonna clash on this issue. And I, Phil asked me why we were defending the First Amendment rights of the Klan and I explained. And then he turns to Hosea Williams and he asks him, and Hosea Williams agrees with me. And yeah. Phil, Phil is sort of... And he gave a really sturdy, compelling defense yeah. as well and related it to his role as a civil rights leader and why he oh, felt right. personally invested in what you were doing. Right. Well, because what he said, you know, this is, this is, this is like 40-something years ago. Uh, and and um, when I... When, I know it's in the film, but when I uh, first told the story uh, uh, to Nico, um, uh, I, 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 I wasn't a thousand percent sure that I was remembering it accurately, but he actually found the film clip of that show. And I was much relieved that I had remembered it accurately because what Jose Williams says is, well, he says, you know, nobody hates the Klan and nobody has better reason to hate the Klan and everything they represent than I do. Um, but if I allow the, the police in Georgia to stop the Klan on Monday, they will use that power to stop me from working to register blacks to vote in Fulton County on Tuesday and Wednesday and every week thereafter. And I can't let the state of Georgia have that power. So if I have to deal with the insult um, and the and and the pain of watching these characters in pillowcases and sheets parading in the streets, I will do that because it protects my right to speech. Because the yeah. real enemy of free speech, not the Klan or the neo-Nazis, the real enemy is government power. And that's what I have to stop. And you know, that was that was an argument made by a civil rights activist that was coming from him was so much more powerful than anything that I said. And that's the case now. That's, that's, the, whole, that's the same point I was trying to make with those black students on the hate speech codes on, on college campuses in the, in the 90s. Um, it's a self-protection position that you take. Um, you know, why would Jews, as perhaps historically the most hated, consistently hated and abused minority in the history in the world, why would Jews want to cede the power to a government that has never been friendly? <laughs> Any government, um, you know. Okay, we'll 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 let we'll let Donald Trump decide whether we can speak. No, <laughs> you know. Yeah, or it's a majoritarian sentiment in general. You know, whoever in general, is that's right because because democracy is an instrument of majority rule. Liberty is an instrument of limiting majority rule in order to protect the people who are always outvoted. Yeah, That's, otherwise in democracies, minorities would have no protection because the majority could didn't. just run as they yeah. didn't, exactly. So let me, let, let's shift a little bit to Charlottesville and to a lot of the current debates surrounding the ACLU. Um, obviously, just to remind people in 2017, um, a, a white supremacist group applied for a marching permit um, to march against the uh, removal of various Confederate statutes. 
um, and were told that they couldn't march in the park that has a lot of political significance where marchers typically march, that they had to go to a much less prominent location. Um, and the ACLU defended them. And one of the things that I think people forgot is just like in Skokie, where the neo-Nazis didn't end up marching through Skokie, even though you won the right for them to do so, they ended up marching in Chicago and were humiliated because, you know, 10 of them showed up, 15 freaks and losers showed up, and thousands of people showed up against them. The same thing happened after Charlottesville, where, you know, I think they tried to march at Boston or somewhere, and they were surrounded by thousands of people, showing that if you let terrible views be heard, it strengthens the opposition more so than censoring them. Um, but what do you make of that, that whole debate um, in the wake of Charlottesville about not just the role that the ACLU ought to be playing, but how free speech should be understood in the Trump era where people believe white supremacy and, and neo-fascism is on the rise and that therefore maybe it was a different framework than it was in the 80s and 90s? Well, you know, first of all, you know, the ACLU of Virginia, uh, the state affiliate um, that took the case originally, took the right position, I think, and they basically won the case. And, 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 and Charlottesville, uh, what happened in Charlottesville, remember, the, the one person who was killed was not killed by a gun, he was killed by a car. And, and, um, uh, and the only thing you can think about, how is it that somebody was allowed to drive a car headlong into a group of demonstrators? Well, that was a failure of the police. Um, the police role, when you have two hostile groups demonstrating in the same space, is to protect the rights of both to demonstrate, but make sure, if you think that there might be violence between them, uh, to keep them separated. Um, that's the role of the police. Now, for many years, that didn't happen in any place. In, in New York in 1971, there was a famous uh, case that we took where where uh, people protesting the war uh, against the war in Vietnam were marching in, uh, down a, a canyon street in, in Wall Street, and they were attacked by construction workers who were working down there and didn't like their views and were strong proponents of the war, and they attacked these kids. And what the city did is it banned the march because the march had provoked violence. Um, and we said, well, that's like banning the Freedom Riders because they provoke violence in the South. You know, what your role as police is to do is to protect the rights of people who are demonstrating peacefully. And if there are other people who are violent, you arrest them. You stop them from being violent. You don't stop the people from demonstrating in order to deal with the violence against them. And and that's what, what happened. And you know, finally, it took years. It took lawsuits. Um, it, took, it took decades of negotiations with the police in New York. But finally, we pretty much worked things out so that, so that we reached a point where when demonstrations took place among opposing groups, the police understood their role as, as protecting the rights of both so long as they stayed peaceful, and if anybody got violent, those are the people you arrest. Um, now, what happened in Charlottesville is that the cops were overwhelmed. They hadn't had much experience with this in Charlottesville. They didn't know what to do. Um, there, it was poor planning. They didn't keep the group separated. Um, and that police failure led to confrontations and led to uh, access of one group against the other. And that's how it got to be that a car was able to plow headlong. I mean, in New York, that could never have happened because there would have been barriers set up. There would have been no way that a car could get anywhere close to, to demonstrators. Um, so, you know, the, 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 failure, uh, the failure in Charlottesville, I really have always regarded, uh, and again, I wasn't involved in the case. I mean, I'm looking at it from afar. I really don't know any more details about it than, uh, than you or anyone else knows reading the papers, watching television. But that was a police failure. Uh, it wasn't a constitutional failure. It wasn't a failure of free speech. It was a failure uh, to protect free speech against violence. And it was a police failure. Now, what happened later is that uh, the national ACLU issued some sort of a statement that 
read on its face, appeared to back off a little bit from what the ACLU of Virginia had done and said things about how they're not going to defend uh, people who carry guns, and which led me to wonder about where we never said anything like that when the Black Panthers were walking around carrying guns. So is this political or is this constitutional? Um, what's the issue here? Um, but the larger question that you're raising is a question of the young generation of activists who seem to believe that the cause of social justice requires opposition to the First Amendment or the free speech because they are so frequently confronted, not by 10 or 15 lunatics in, in Skokie, uh, or, but by massive amounts of what they see as racist speech uh, supported by the President of the United States, uh, representing maybe millions of people, encouraging things like what happened in Portland, Oregon, and in Wisconsin, in Kenosha, and, 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 and they don't have any history. They don't know about John Lewis. They don't know about Margaret Sanger. They don't know about the early labor union activists. Um, all they know is that they are passionate about racial justice and uh, other kinds of social justice issues. And everywhere they look, they are confronted by a national political leadership that is encouraging uh, bands of, 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 of bigoted, racist, sexist hordes, as they see it. So, so, so they, it's, it, it's not surprising to me that what they would think is, well, we gotta, we, we, we gotta stop these people. They're, they're gonna, they're gonna hurt us. They're gonna stop us. We gotta stop them before they stop us. And they come to think that their fight for social justice and the right of free speech is our antagonist because they take their own right of free speech for granted and they see their opponent's free speech as a threat and they want it stopped. And, um, you know, the analogy that I always use in talking about this is poison gas. You know, and when, when, when you've got some real enemies out in front of you and they seem to be advancing on you and they seem maybe to even outnumber you, now you have some poison gas and you've got them in your sights. It's very tempting to use it. You want to use it. So you start using it. And then the wind shifts and the gas gets blown back on you. And that's what happens with poison gas. And that's what happens with speech restrictions. Because you always think these would be a good thing to stop those people. But then the political wind shift, and pretty soon uh, the power to stop those people becomes the power to stop you. And that's the Hosea Williams story. And that's the John Lewis story. And that's the story of the Zionist kids in, in, uh, in England who in the 1970s supported a hate speech code in, in university campuses in England uh, that banned racist speech. And then a few years later, the political wind shifted and the Zionists got banned uh, because they, the majority decided that Zionism was a form of racism. Um, so, you know, I went, I went to talk to a University of Chicago Law School audience uh, a couple of years ago. Actually, uh, Ben Stern from Skokie and I were on a panel together in front of this audience. And the audience itself thrilled me. I mean, there probably were a couple of hundred people uh, students at the University of Chicago Law School. You know, University of Chicago Law School is a, one of the top law schools. These are very bright kids. But the thing that thrilled me was it was a rainbow scene. Uh, you know, there were a roughly equivalent number of women to men. There was every skin color on the rainbow <laughs> who was in the room. There were people with turbans and, 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 uh, uh, various kinds of Muslim headdress. And, and um, it was the kind of law school audience we used to fight for in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And, and in those years never hoped to see because law schools didn't accept. So, I mean, even women, law schools were slow in accepting as Ruth Ginsburg's story shows. And 
So I'm looking out at this audience and I'm saying, wow, this is fabulous. I haven't spoken to a law school audience in more than a decade, but this is great. And, you know, we give our little talks and Ben Stern and I go back and forth about what happened in Skokie. And then I find that the dominant number of people who ask questions from that audience thought that their advocacy for social justice was opposed by advocates of free speech because for them on campuses, they had been confronted by all of these right-wing characters coming along and, and resisting them. And they felt beleaguered by it. And I realized that they didn't know any history. When I said to them that, you know, every social justice movement in America has started out from a weak, vulnerable position and has absolutely depended upon free speech uh, to resist government attempts to suppress them, every single one, I can't think of one that, that, that wasn't. Their major reaction was, why not? I mean, they had never heard of it. Well, why would they? They were, they were 22 years old or whatever they were. Um, they had not learned any of this history. I didn't know that history when I was their age. I learned most of that history at the ACLU, not in school. And, and Ben Stern, who was the Holocaust survivor from Skokie, who was on the other side of our litigation in Skokie back in the 70s, leans over to me. He's 97 years old. He can hardly see. He can hardly hear. And he leans over to me and whispers, they don't know any history. They don't know your history and they don't know my history. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that is what, what, what has to be done. And, um, and so, you know, I always regarded my role in the ACLU aside from managing the organization, directing the organization, raising money and all the rest of it. Um, I always regarded my role as a publicist. I always regarded the ACLU's role with the larger, uh, uh, public and public opinion as as a role of public education, that, that it was our task to teach this history to people who didn't know it. And because you couldn't rely on the courts forever, as we now see, to act as a barrier to majoritarian hysteria. You had to try to convince more people of the value of these principles. And and the ACLU was the only ones doing it. I mean, there was nobody, you know, um, you know, if, if if we if we defended the rights of people to to march outside of an abortion clinic and scream "baby murderers, baby murderers" at the women going in, I mean, we represented all those clinics. Nobody else was representing the, the abortion clinics but the ACLU. Then we were also representing the people demonstrating outside. Now, you know, it, it, it was very hard to tell people who were being called baby murderers um, that, they, that, that they had a self-interest in, in their opponent's rights to speak because of the same reasons that we've been talking about. And the interest that the vulnerable minorities have in protecting the rights of people who are bigots is to protect their own rights. It's a pure matter of insurance policy. It's a political strategy. It is not an ivory tower. Yeah. So I can spend all day talking to you about this. Um, I hope everybody watches the film, but I have time for one more question. Um, and it relates to a lot of what you just said about the need for persuasion um, one of the things that, that I, I found so moving in the film that I did not know about was there was obviously a lot of antagonism between residents of Skokie and the ACLU at the time. Um, and yet you formed this incredibly moving, deep friendship with um, one of the Holocaust survivors who was one of the leaders of the opposition in Skokie, uh, Ben Steiner, you just referenced. Um, but you also had a similarly affectionate friendship. Um, with somebody else who, with whom you were a political adversary, which is William Buckley. Um, and I didn't know that either. It started with some very vociferous debates on firing line and elsewhere, and it morphed into 
this kind of very warm friendship where he was a friend of, of you and your wife and, and you were a friend of his and, and, and his wife. Um, what is it that we can learn about when we think about the need for persuasion, the need to convince other people using this free speech right that we have? What lessons can we draw from those two friendships that you shared and developed with people who had very profound disagreements with you on some really important issues? Well, you know, the first thing is, is that these are not abstract issues. These are issues that affect real people on a, on a personal level. And, you know, if you sit in, in a room and write creeds and issue press releases and, and Jeremiah's from the rooftops and, and scream and yell, and you never actually touch anybody, um, it's very easy to dehumanize the people you disagree with. Um, and the thing that happened with Buckley and that happened with Ben um, were unanticipated, unplanned. Uh, they were not part of a program. Um, it just, it, it happened, they happened in very different ways. But the very first time I met Ben Stern, uh, when I came out to participate uh, at a panel with him uh, at Berkeley uh, uh, to, to talk about a showing of the documentary on his life that his daughter had made. Uh, I had spoken to her a bunch of times, but I had never spoken to him, much less met him. And I go out to Berkeley and his daughter picks me up and he's in the car and she's taking me back to her house and, and he gets out of the car. I mean, the man is at the time 95, 96, and he's, he's very small. And he, he uh, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm much bigger than him and uh, than he. And um, uh, he gets out very pugnacious and he sticks out his hand to me, offers his hand, shakes his hand and says, we're not going to agree, but we're going to be friends. And, you know, that to start with was so disarming because, because I had thought of him as this ferocious opponent of everything that we stood for. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, how am I going to talk to this man? First of all, I'm not going to lecture him about the First Amendment. I'm not going to, you know, I mean, he went through things that I cannot imagine going through. And, and I think I would be in a murderous frame of mind if I went through half of what he went through. So I'm thinking, how, how am I going to deal with that? You know, on a personal level. And he comes out and says, we're not going to agree, but we're going to be friends. And he shakes my hand. OK, so we go back to his daughter's uh, home and we sit in his kitchen. And she makes some lunch and, and, and we start to talk. And it was just a lot of human contact there. I mean, you know, it ended up with him saying, you have to come back to my house, never mind my daughter's house. And I go back to his house and he offers me schnapps. And, 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 we start, and I start talking about my grandfather who came from Poland, where he, where he was from. And, and it just, there, was, there were points of contact on a human level that could never have happened if you stayed in separate bubbles, you know, and just attacked each other on the issues, the people are more than just the issues. Uh, with Buckley, it was also accidental and, and but, but, but similar. Um, I was on one of his firing line shows debating the issue of flag desecration. And, and I was arguing that there was a constitutional right for somebody to burn a flag if it's their own flag. And, um, uh, and, and that people often do that uh, because, you know, I told him a case about Sidney Street, who was a black guy in Harlem, who on the day that James Meredith trying to enter the University of Mississippi was shot, um, uh, Sidney Street gets up on a street corner in Harlem, burns the flag and says, um, you know, if James Meredith can get shot just for attending the University of Mississippi, we don't need no damn flag. And of course, he could have said the same thing in words on that same street corner in Harlem, and nobody but the six people on the street corner would have heard him. 
But by burning the flag, he got onto the six o'clock news and millions of people heard. So I'm trying to explain how, you know, if that's a form of speech that is designed to, to more successfully uh, propagate your message. And it should be protected uh, because it's not harming anybody. And the flag is not a religious sacred icon. It's just a piece of material and it represents the country. And in fact, the flag represents uh, the right to burn it. It represents freedom and free speech. And that's all that he was doing. Buckley was inconsolable. He, he was arguing you know, that, that uh, uh, yeah, but this is the American flag. You can't burn it. And at one point in the back and forth, he says to me, uh, well, you know, I, I understand what you're saying as a matter of constitutional law. But think of the average person out there, you know, who fought in World War II and, 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 and maybe had friends die and, and, and they fought for the flag. Think of how the average person feels when somebody burns a flag, which was, you know, as Buckley often did, an effective emotional argument. I mean, how, you know, and you're on television and you've got five minutes, five seconds to reply. So I smile and I look at him and I say, Bill, calling him Bill, who I, I didn't really know him at the time. I said, Bill, um, what would you know about the average man? You have lived an isolated life among, you know, brought up by people in your family who owned oil wells and, you know, raised. Uh, in the home of, of with, with, with other people than your parents hired to take care of you. I mean, in Sharon, Connecticut, I mean, what would you know about the average man? I said, you know, my father was a construction worker. I grew up on the streets in Brooklyn. I, you know, I, I didn't know anybody in my father's family who had more than a fifth grade education. I, you know, lived my life on the streets and in the subways of New York, um, you're the one who's strange to me, but how, what would you, you don't know, you're asking me about average men. I live among average men. You've never seen one. The closest you've ever come to an average man is me. And <laughs> this is on television, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and it was good. And, 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 and then in the course of the back and forth before the show ends, I say to him, you want to, you want to hear about average you want to see average people? I'll take you to Nathan's, to Coney Island, and I'll show you what average people are like. And the show ends. And I figure, okay, good, I got him. You know, it was a good repost. And, and uh, we get back, I get back to my office, and there's, my secretary says, I just got called by William Buckley's secretary, Frances. And um, she and my, my secretary had become sort of telephone buddies because they... They were negotiating so many times of being on television with him. And she says, and, and, and uh, Buckley uh, wants to accept your invitation to go to Nathan's and he'll, he'll, uh, uh, he want, wants, to, wants to get a date. So we get a time <laughs> and he picks me up outside the ACLU office in his chauffeur limousine. And all right. I mean, I was going to go out with the D train, but okay. And 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 he, we drive out, and and I have to tell them how to go through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and the Belt Parkway and where to get off. And and there we are. And we're in front of we're we're a block or two from Nathan's, and he prepares to get out, and he says to his chauffeur, whose name is Jerry, um, "Just wait here. We'll be back in an hour or so." So I say to him, Bill. You can't leave Jerry here in this 10 foot, you know, 20 foot long black limousine. He's, a, you know, he'll get killed. They'll think he's a drug dealer. Somebody will shoot him. You can't leave him here. You know, we'll take him with us. And besides which, he said, he's one of your average guys. You probably don't even know him. <laughs> You've probably never seen him outside of looking at the back of his head. So, <laughs> so he's sort of embarrassed. <laughs> And then, and then later, as part of my continuing effort to acquaint him with average people, I end up taking him to his first baseball game. Uh, because I see Yeah, which is in the film. Yeah, 
and 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 that was also an accident. I mean, because because he had never been he he was on the Charlie Rose show and he was talking about the, the resurrection being literally true and his, his his life as a Catholic and and his beliefs. And then at some point, um, Rose asked him a question which elicits from him an answer that no, he's never been to a baseball game, and he had no interest in being to a baseball game. So I go back to the office the next morning and I write him a letter and I said, you know, it's a good thing that the ACLU had abolished the House on American Activities Committee because if I've ever heard of something, the most un-American thing I've ever heard of, yeah, you would report him. Yeah, year old white man who's, right, who's never been to a baseball game. Mm-hmm. And I said, and, and, but it's fortunate that, you know, this is not something you should live with because it, it could make you very vulnerable. Um, but you were fortunate in that, in that you happen to have in me the very best person in the country to go to your first baseball game with. And we go back and forth and he agrees to come with me to opening day the next season. And we had like a long series of correspondence of, uh, about it that itself is, is, is wonderful, uh, in which I basically instruct him about the etiquette of baseball games. <laughs> and, and we go to them and again, like did Nathan's, he tells me he'll pick Jerry will pick me up. Uh, and he and Jerry will pick me up at the limousine outside the ACLU office. And I drew the line in the dirt on that. I said, Bill, we do not go to baseball games with limousines. We go by the subway. And it turns out that aside from a, a, a ceremonial uh, uh, appearance during the time that he ran for mayor in 1965, it turns out that like he's never been to a baseball game and like he never was to Coney Island, He's never been in the subway. He's yeah, and he's in lived in New York his whole life, right? Or Connecticut. So or- said, we're going by subway, Bill, or we're not going. And and um, uh, so he says, okay. And and Jerry drives the limousine to the ACLU office, and Bill gets out, and I meet him outside on the sidewalk. And we go into the subway, and we go out. We go out to the number seven train to uh, to uh, to Shea Stadium, and we go go to the game. And he he loved it. I mean, he just he loved it. He loved the food. He loved the atmosphere. I mean, he was it was the first time that I saw a kind of a graciousness in him and a kind of a commonality that I had never seen on his show. And it was there was something charming about it, um, even though I always stayed arm's length because I knew what he really believed. (laughs) And and. um, and so we, you know, we 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 went to the game, and and uh, I was on the show dozens of times after that, uh, uh, before I retired, and um, uh, and eventually, I, my wife and I were invited to his house in Stanford for dinner, and that's when I met his wife Pat, and and I, I walk in, and she is in this long sort of dressing gown, with with a long. Um, a cigarette in a in a in a in a holder uh, of the kind that, that Roosevelt used to have that I had never seen anybody use except Roosevelt, and and she was very patrician, um, and she she walks up to me and she greets me very sweetly and says, "I don't understand." She says, "You are so mean to my husband Bill on television," and I look at her and say, "Well, Pat." He says so many awful things. <laughs> right. I can not be mean to him. But, you know, he had lived in this bubble all his life. And I, that became my mission to familiarize himself with, to familiarize him with the average person. I mean, the first time I went through an airport with him on the, on the way to some place where we were debating, I said to him, I have to stop at the cash machine. Uh, I needed some cash. And I found out he never heard cash machine. Not that he had never used one, which I would have understood. He didn't know that there were cash machines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, that was how insulated, you know. And and so the basis of, 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 of our relationship became this kind of thing where I think at some level, he could not understand how somebody like me could be smart enough and knowledgeable enough to hold his own with somebody like him. It didn't fit. And I didn't understand how somebody like like him could have grown up so isolated from everything that he was talking about. You know, he I realized that 
if a black woman working as a secretary in his in the National Review in his office had had a son who got arrested falsely and was in trouble, he would have moved mountains to get that kid good representation and to be sympathetic. But if he was on television debating the issue of the Central Park Five, he would have taken horrible positions. And 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 what that really showed to me um, was that you have to make human connections. You can't live in abstractions because living in abstractions encourages dehumanizing your opponent and it encourages bad things to happen. And, and that for me was the lesson of both the Ben Stern and the Bill Buckley stories. And, and, um, and, I, and I thought, you know, that Nico and his crew did a wonderful job in showing that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we began this discussion by my saying that I thought the film Standing Alone is a fascinating history, um, not just of your career, but of the country, right, with which your career was so inextricably linked because of you were at the center of so many debates, um, but that it wasn't just interesting as a history, but also because it has so many lessons to learn um, for our current situation, our current political challenges, our current debates, um, and I agree with you completely that there is a lack of historical knowledge, which is one of the reasons I really want to encourage as many people as possible to see the film. Um, not just because that history is important, though it is, but because it really gives you just a lot more perspective about um, contemporary questions as well. I, it was a thrill to talk to you. Um, it was a thrill to see the film. Um, and I really hope we could do it again sometime and we can explore some of those other issues yes, that I, we I kind would, of placed off on that. the side. I would love that, Glenn. Uh, and let me let me also say before we sign off, um, I want I want to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate you on 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 the whole thing that happened with you and 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 Ed, Edward Snowden. Uh, I was of course looking at that from afar. Uh, I was long since departed the ACLU, but but I thought that show that David Carr before just before he died uh, had uh, with you and. Um, What's her name? I'm forgetting. Her yeah, name. Laura Poitras and, and Laura, Snowden. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and Snowden uh, in in Russia uh, was just was just wonderful in in explicating for people who did not know the details some of what was going on and and uh, uh, and uh, I want to I want to thank you for bringing that out as much as you did. It was uh, it was so easy for somebody like Snowden to get categorized and and, and demonized. Uh, in the media uh, for what he had done, and um, uh, and I, I thought I thought you did a great job with him. So thank you. All right, Ira. Thanks so much. Great talking to you, and I hope to talk to you again.